Okay, we're going to be in 2 Peter today, 2 Peter um, chapter 1, and uh, Peter's a great guy. I really love Peter because uh, Peter is a man of, he's just, he's just a grinded out man. He's the kind of guy that had dirty fingernails, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I refer to myself as a knuckle dragger. Peter's probably a knuckle dragger, okay? Wasn't very, uh, wasn't educated. He knew the Jewish way of life, wasn't very educated. He was a fisherman by trade, okay? Probably a mediocre fisherman, okay? And, um, but the thing I like about Peter is his personality. He was red hot. He let you know when he was ticked off. He let you know what he was thinking. He was boastful. He was, uh, he was ex extreme in every way. I mean, in other words, he would get upset and then he would concede and he would and ask for forgiveness almost right away, almost in the same sentence. He could go all the ends of the spectrum. So, you know, and it, it, he reminds me a lot of myself um, and uh, in, a, in a bad way and a good way. So, um, and when I say that, is, I say in a good way is I want to be the man that Peter became by meeting Jesus Christ. And we're going to see a little bit of that today. So, uneducated Peter. He runs into Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ changes his whole life, turns it upside down. And uh, despite the mistakes, despite the shortcomings, we know he denies Jesus three, uh, uh, three times before the rooster crows. That's a dramatic scene um, just prior to Jesus' death. And, uh, but, you know, and he still, and God, Christ redeems him and uses him greatly. So if you want to follow an interesting character in the Bible, or in the New Testament, I should say, follow the character of Peter all the way through the Gospels and through the book of Acts. And now we're going to study his word, what he actually wrote as inspired by God. And I'm in 2 Peter, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. And let's, I'm going to start at the beginning just for context. Give me just a moment here. So, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. In both Peter's letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, he throws out, he comes out firing. He, it's first pitch fastball every time. It, it, Peter doesn't spare any words and he just tells you right away, God's divine power has given you everything you need for a godly life. God's divine power has given you everything you need for a godly life. Through the knowledge, through the, our knowledge of Him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. This is meant to reassure the believer. Peter is writing to believers. Earlier in his first letter, he's writing to believers that have been scattered. And here we don't know. We don't know if they've been scattered or not, but he's writing to reassure the believer. And so you may say to yourself, why, why is it so important that I, that I show up on Sunday? I mean, I guess if I would have missed it, it would have been pretty weird today, right? You'd have nobody up here. But I mean, for you guys, right? I mean, so it's rainy. I'm going to skip it today. I'm going to catch the early game. But Peter here says that it is important because he's going to remind us, the believer, that God has given us everything. You see what I'm saying? He's going to go back and do something really basic. He's going to go back and do something really basic. He's going to say, I'm going to remind you that God has given you everything. And how has that been given to us? It's been given to us through His divine power. 
Let me remind you of God's power just a little bit. God's power. God has the power to create. Okay? How many have seen a little shot of an, an ultrasound shot? Right? At, at like, I don't know, 10 weeks, get a beaten heart, right? Even before that. Okay? And how do all those little cells know who's going to be a hair, who's going to be an eyeball, who's going to be a toenail? I don't know. God tells him to, okay? Let me show you how he creates. Genesis 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God spoke, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's power. That's power. You know? I can say in my household, hey, let's everybody calm down, and nobody does what I ask them to do. <laughs> I got no power, okay? No power. God has the power to make us free. God has the power to make us free. I don't know if you know this or not, but you're captive. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a captive of the enemy. And there's a great picture of that in the Old Testament, and that's when the Jews were a captive of the Egyptians. When they were held hostage by the Egyptians, and they were made slaves to make bricks without straw. And God makes them free. Exodus 14, Then Moses, God's chosen servant, stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back with a strong east wind, drove the sea back, excuse me, with a strong east wind, and turned the land and then turned it into dry land. And the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on the dry ground, with a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. Here's the large, world's largest aquarium. Makes Monterey's aquarium look tiny, right? And they're walking through the, the, the Red Sea on dry ground. Not murk, not mud, okay? But on dry ground. God did that. God set the captives free. He'll do that in your life, too, if you let him. God has the power to raise the dead. The power to raise the dead. You say, oh, well, wait a minute. I, I haven't seen that happen. Oh, really? So look at John chapter 11. Jesus said to her, he's talking to Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then he walks to Lazarus' grave and he says, take away the stone. But, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. I think the King James Version says, he stinketh. Okay, so Lazarus is in the grave for four days, and there he is. And Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you, were always, you would always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. Isn't that great? that Jesus includes this story. He does this. We get to hear this. So it's the benefit for those that are standing here and for those that are sitting here today. We're opening God's Word. We're hearing the words of Jesus that He put out just for you and me. For the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe you sent me. And when He had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take, off the take the grave clothes off him and let him go. Power to raise the dead. Now you may say, well, I've never seen this happen. Well, if you believe in Jesus Christ, in a sense, this has already happened to you. You've been raised from spiritual deadness, which, by the way, is much greater than physical deadness. Spiritually dead, you're condemned to be without the Lord for all of eternity. 
He's raised you from spiritual deadness, from deafness of hearing His Word. If you, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, He's already worked this power in your life to raise you from that spiritual deadness, to walk with Him, to be His friend. You can call Him friend now. Before, He was a great teacher. He was a cool dude. He was Buddha's buddy. No, He's none of that. He's, uh, he's the, your Lord and Savior. And you're risen from your spiritual deadness because of Him. Power. Power to sustain. The Son, the author of Hebrews tells us, the Son is the radiance of God's glory. That's Jesus Christ. The radiance of God's glory and the exact reputation, uh, I mean, representation of His being. Sustaining all things by His powerful word. After he had provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So from his seat in heaven, he is sustaining all things. What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, my son has a fascination with the science channel. And sometimes I'll sit down with him. And now there's kind of these cool series that's trying to make scientists kind of look cool. And, uh, which they are. They're kind of cool guys. And um, they all come on and they talk about, uh, one show the other day was about Einstein and about uh, what he had discovered and all these things. And uh, one of the things that fascinates me about science is, and this, this show always proves it out to me, is how precarious it is. How every time we discover something, we, 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 have, we find out all sorts of new questions we have to ask and that, that, need, that need answers. And being curious beings, which is what separates us from the animals, by the way, being curious thinking beings, we, we, we try to figure these things out. And we try to attribute them to some equation or some formula. And every time we figure that formula out, it's a new one. The new one we got to figure out. So, but what I'm trying to say here, I'm, get, I'm, I'm a little distracted, I'm sorry, but God is holding the universe together. The theory in this science show that I want to tell you about was that at some point the universe is going to run out of energy and stop expanding and then turn very cold and dark and collapse on itself. That's a theory. How did it... Has that happened? No. I mean, perhaps it will. I don't know. I don't know how God's going to wrap everything up. But God had the power to create that. He had the power to expand it. Even as we speak now, at the outer edge of the universe, creation is going on. New worlds are being created. Yeah, exactly. So it's just fascinating to me, and he's sustaining that. If imagine, um, the point of the show was that if one of these principles didn't work within science, then everything would come crashing down on itself. Well, wait a minute. What is that? That sounds like something sustaining the universe in the order that it's in. If one principle were to slip out of place, if E equals MC squared would all of a sudden not equal MC squared, what would happen? Well, somebody's got to hold that thing together. It's Jesus Christ, sustaining all things by, the power, by His powerful Word. I gave the example last week of the wind and the waves recognizing Jesus' voice and stopping. God, through Jesus Christ, has the power to perfect. The power to perfect, to make all things new. In Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. God has the power to make all things new. He has the power to bring a new order into existence. That's the power, that's the power that has bestowed upon you, that has given you everything you need. The word given, I, you know, I, when I put this message together, 
usually what I do is I pray about what I'm going to speak about and uh, I, I hope that this is the right passage and maybe the Lord changes my mind sometimes in that process. And then I look for one key word in it that really says something to me. And the word I found was given this week. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great, given. So I go and do what's called a word study on the word given. And you know what I found out? It just means gifted to. I usually would have like some 10 point definition on what that word is, but I don't have it that week, this week. I have gifted to you. It means given. It means exactly what it says. It's given to you. What is given? Everything we need for a godly life. The King James Version says, given, us, given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The word all there, that's another great word. It means all. It means everything you need. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you got 99% of it, 75% of it. It means all. Okay? So let me give you an example. How am I going to get through bankruptcy? He's given me everything I need to conduct my life in a godly manner, whether I'm in bankruptcy or not. How am I going to get through getting fired? He's given me everything I need, even though I got fired. How am I going to get through a divorce? Oh, wait a minute right here. He's given me everything I need to, leave a godly li to live a godly life. <coughs> to conduct myself in the correct manner, regardless of how the other party in the divorce conducts themselves. What am I going to do to get through a tough marriage? Oh, wait a minute. Everything we need for a godly life. Nothing got left out. So if your husband's not a believer and that's a tough time at home, guess what? He's given you, wife, everything you need to lead a godly life with a person at home who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. And vice versa. Loss of a spouse. Loss of a loved one. He's given, we were talking about Dan. Dan lost his, his sister-in-law. We're all praying for him. All right. God has given Dan and his brother everything he needs to get through this. Now you can choose, here's the roll of the dice here, you can choose to say, I'm going to be mad at God. I'm going to be angry at God for how this has turned out. But let it be known, He's given you everything you need. <clears throat> that word godliness or godly life is, is referred to as godliness in the King James Version. That is a real, true, vital, and spiritual relation with God. Okay? That means that your life is going to reflect that real, true, and vital relationship with God. That's what it's going to look like to others and to yourself. And here's, here's one point I want to point out, an thing I, important thing I want to point out about this word given. Is the Lord has given it to you. You didn't earn it. You didn't do any work to get it. Matter of fact, He did all the work. He took the chains, he took the beatings, he took the crown of thorns, he took the nails in his, uh, in his, in his wrists. He did it. He did all that work. Paul states it in another way. Here in Romans 6, 23, he said, For the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. In the book of Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through, the, through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Remember I talked about Peter earlier, how I kind of see myself sometimes that way. I am so thankful that it's a gift and I can't boast about it. Because if I could boast about it, I most certainly would. I'm such a depraved human being. I would just brag about it until my heart's content that I got that gift. And I earned it. Wouldn't that be disgusting? What would that look like? Okay. 
I'm thankful that the Lord brought me to a point where, only, where I could only surrender to His heavy hand and toss away my will and accept the gift of His will. I'm so thankful for that. And by the way, this, this is a simple truth in the, in the Bible. And I think part of the problem with maybe if you're struggling with accepting the Lord as your Savior, if you're struggling with accepting the Lord as your Savior, if you know people that are struggling with accepting the Lord as your Savior, this is part of the stumbling block. Because they just can't figure out it's a gift. For years I couldn't figure out it was a gift. I thought there was something I should have done for it. Or that I thought that I've done so much of things that the Lord wouldn't agree with that I could never get it. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything to earn it back. I've, I've gone too far over the edge. But no, it's a gift. It's a gift. And so maybe your prayer for that person that doesn't know the Lord is that they would learn to, under, uh, to accept the gift, to understand it's a gift and to accept it as a gift. Okay. Um, It's a gift. How do we exercise this gift? How does this gift become, how do we claim ownership of this gift? Through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through the knowledge. The word there is knowledge. Knowledge is, think of knowledge here as this window, as this portal of which through all things that we need are given to us. Okay? So, this is where you and I come in. This is where there is a level or a degree that, that we can participate here. It's almost like there's a volume knob on God's power in giving us everything we need. And the more knowledge we have, the more we turn it up, right? The more we turn up that volume, and it gets up to 11 up there, right? You can put it on 11 and just blow the speakers out, wake the neighbors, right? This is where we get to participate, and we need to garner knowledge. It says here, our knowledge. Not just knowledge, not just the Bible sitting on the, on the shelf gathering dust. Your knowledge in your head and in your heart. That means you own it, you've seen it, you've read it, you've lived it. One of the beautiful things of the Bible is you read something in the Bible, you read something that's a promise or a, a warning, and then it happens in your life, and you say, my God, it, I read that. And now you own it. It becomes part of you. And that becomes part of your knowledge base. And that opens that portal, that window, or I should say turns up the volume of what God has given you in your life. He's given you what? Everything. Everything you need for a godly life. Any history buffs here? I'm kind of a little history buff. Let's say you want to know Teddy Roosevelt. Well, how do you get to know Teddy Roosevelt? <laughs> President of the United States, Rough Rider. How do you get to know him? Established in national parks. Well, you can't go to his house and sit on his porch and hear stories from him anymore. You'd have to go to the library. Or you could go to the internet nowadays, I guess. And you'd have to do some reading about him. You'd have to do some studying about it. Maybe you'd go visit his, his birthplace. Maybe you'd go, uh, you know, read every book that you could find on him. There's some great books on Teddy Roosevelt. And you'd get to know him. And you'd say, man, it's like, it's like Teddy Roosevelt's right here. And there are historians, uh, Mr. Ambrose, who's no longer with us, for example, that knew people in our history, such as Lewis and Clark, so well, it's like he knew them like they were friends because he had studied their life. Mr. Ambrose actually went as far to actually travel the route that Lewis and Clark traveled. That's how well he knew him. Well, 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 what about this guy, Jesus Christ? How would you get to know him? Well, you'd, you'd read his word. You'd study his book. And guess what? There's one book. You don't have to go to the library and, and pull down reams of books to know him. You just need to read one. It's all about him. We went over it last week. If you go back and get the notes, there's five points on that. It's, this book's all about him. From front to back. You'd get to know Jesus Christ by reading his word. Making it a part of your life. Listen to Hebrews. Listen to the author of Hebrews. This guy was bright. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. 
which are included in here, by the way, in the Old Testament. God spoke to our authors, ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and whom, all, he all, and whom also made, and, and through whom, excuse me, and through whom also he made the universe. Oh, say, so in the last days, God has chosen, and we're in the last days, by the way, and they could go on for a while, I know, you know, but in God's eye, they're a blink. Okay, so we're in the last days, and God's chosen to speak to you and me through His Son. First of all, just a little side note, that means if you run into somebody and they say, you know, God spoke to me and He told me this in your life, well, you want to confirm it with what the Bible says. But what... Jesus actually said in the book, not, not just some guy. Uh, there's a great story of a pastor. This lady came up to him and said, God told me that you're going to marry me. It's Greg Laurie, by the way. And Greg says, well, I'll have to let my wife know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a lot of people who think they're hearing from God, but maybe they're not. All right. So, but God spoke to us through Jesus Christ, and his word and his life is recorded right here. And that's where you're going to get it. Listen to the Bereans. Now the Berean Jews were, were of a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message, that the gospel, with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day. How many days? Every day to see if what Paul said was true. And by the way, on your way home or when you get home, you can pick up the book and you can look in here and say, gosh, was what Rich was talking about, is that really true? You can confirm that. That's the great thing about the Bible. I'm not trying to say anything you can't go confirm. Okay, what Paul said it was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and Greek men. Knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge is your um, barometer or your altimeter. It's, it's your way to increase the power of God in your life for everything you need for a godly life. Your knowledge. So, you know, that's up to you. That's on you. All right? God's implanted the Holy Spirit in your heart. He saved you. Uh, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Great. But you want to take advantage of everything that He has for you in your life. You want to be in full force with His will. Guess what? Gain knowledge. Gain knowledge of Jesus Christ. Turn up the volume. Through these, this is verse 4 of our, of our selection today, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. So through these, that these here is everything you need, by the way. Through these things, that's everything you need. So through everything you need, He's given you His very great and precious promises. 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 What are his promises? Let's, uh, we could be here all day going over God's promises, so I'll warn you that we won't be. But first of all, there's the promise of his loyalty. Whose loyalty? Not mine. Mine's not very worth anything much at all. Promise of Jesus Christ's loyal, 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 loyalty. To keep your, he, the author of Hebrews says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you he's gonna be loyal to you he's not gonna leave you he's not gonna forsake you Matthew 10 32 whoever acknowledges me that's whoever acknowledges Jesus Christ this, these are these words are in red Jesus is speaking them whoever acknowledges me before others I so I also will acknowledge before my father in heaven So maybe, you know, have, have you ever acknowledged Jesus before others? I mean, I don't mean when you missed that golf shot either. I mean, have you ever really told somebody, hey, Jesus is my Lord and Savior? Because if you have, you know what's awesome about this? Is he said, you know what? I know this guy, Andrew, God. Andrew's awesome. 
I know this guy, Dan. I know this guy, Bob. If you've acknowledged Jesus Christ here while you're walking on the earth, He's acknowledged you before God the Father. He's spoken up for you. And I'm so thankful He has because, you know, I know my accuser, the evil one, he goes and he visits God all the time. He says, hey, God, that guy Rich, you know, you know, you're trying to use him. He's just a mess. He's just a bloody mess. He's making a hash of everything he tries to do. But there's Jesus. Oh, oh yeah, Rich. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to him about him before. Remember, God? He's one of mine. I'm telling you, he's covered. That's what's going on here in Matthew 10:32. The promise of his love. Paul says in Romans 8, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, that's you and me, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The promise of his love. The promise of a righteous life. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. By the way, remember last week you talked about that land a little bit. The lamb, the land in the Old Testament is a picture of the life of the believer in the New Testament. The land, the peace, the milk, the honey of the land in the Old Testament is a picture of the believer of Jesus Christ in the New. That's you and me. If you believe in Jesus Christ, the land is a representation of that. It's a shadow. And here he says, this is in the book of Psalms. He's saying, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. The promise of a righteous life. Maybe your life has not been righteous. Mine certainly hasn't. And yet Jesus Christ here is promising you one if you believe in Him. If you access the knowledge, if you access Him through the, your knowledge of Him. He's promising you a righteous life. If you, that's, that's a word I don't even think that should be in the same paragraph as my name, and yet here it is, right here, promised to me, promised to you. Trust in the Lord. That's one of my life verses here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit. Ooh, I, ah, ouch. Submit to Him and He will make your path straight. My ways are crooked. His ways are straight. I trust in Him. He gives me His ways. I trust in me. I'm all over the map. The promise of a righteous life. The promise of eternal life. Jesus said, we talked about this a little bit earlier, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Forever lives by believing in me, will never die. Do you believe this? And you may say, anyway, we all die. What's, what's going on here, Rich? It's a spiritual life. You don't, you don't suffer that spiritual death. We all experience the physical death. But you don't suffer the spiritual death. The spiritual death is one where you are separated from God from all of eternity. Right now, by the way, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ and you're here on earth, you're not separated from God. You're enjoying the grace that He provides all. The rain, thankfully provided today by the Lord Himself, fell on everyone this morning, didn't it? It just didn't pick out me, just didn't pick out my dry yard to fall on, because I believe in Jesus Christ. It picked out my neighbors and my other neighbors, and they don't know Jesus Christ. The rain falls on all. His grace falls on all. But there will come a physical death. At that physical death, if you have not chosen the Lord as your Savior, you will go on to a spiritual death where you are separated from God from all of eternity. Now, I don't really know what hell looks like. There's some good references to it. And I'm not going to get into an argument about it this morning. But what I will tell you is, it's without the Lord. 
It's without His grace, without His mercy for all of eternity. And that's enough to scare me stiff. The promise of eternal life. And finally, the promise of a new order. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. This is the same reference I read earlier that just followed on a few verses from Revelation. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them, and they will be His people. And God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear. Every tear. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He will create a new order. I came home this week, a little personal story. I'm going to get in trouble for telling this. I came home this week and my wife was in great pain from her back and she was crying. Every tear gets wiped away. Every tear gets wiped away. No pain, no death. New order. <coughs> Those are God's promises, and they're given to you through everything you need for a godly life. And here is the greatest mystery of all. Greatest mystery of all. So that through them, at least to me, so that through these things and through those promises, you may participate in the divine nature. You may participate in the divine nature. The word in the King James Version is partake. And that means to share in common, to partner with, to companion with. To partner with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, in all divine nature. In the story of the gospel, you get to participate. You're not an observer. You're not sitting in the stands watching nine players play baseball. You're participating. This is why it's a mystery. Why? Why would God want me to participate? Why would He want me to participate in the gospel, in salvation? Why would he want me to participate? Why would he want you to participate in his affairs? In his affairs. Why? Because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to, go to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. He's prepared great works for you and I to do. Now, if you ask me, after my mundane week at work, if there's any great works that anybody would ever want to give me, I would say no. But yet, right here in His Word, it says He's created not just works, but good works for us to do. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, your hearts, to give us the light of knowledge, there's that word again, knowledge, of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. You see that? God's glory is displayed through Jesus Christ. The better you know Jesus Christ, the better you know God's glory. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. In other words, what Paul is saying here in the second book to the Corinthians is, hey, you're a jar of clay. You're an imperfect vessel. And yet, within you is this power from God to show off to others to know that it's not from you, jar of clay, little piece of pottery, but it's from the Lord. He goes on to say, we are hard pressed on every side. And this is the Christian church of the first century. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not in abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around on our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. 
You may say, well, wait a minute, Rich. I, I'm not persecuted. I'm doing okay. I'm not crushed. Oh, yeah, really? Just go to work tomorrow and tell somebody you're a believer in Jesus Christ. See how that goes over. And maybe you won't be put in jail like in some countries, but you might be ridiculed. All, yeah, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world him, to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them hallelujah and he committed to us you and me the message of real reconciliation and we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as, God, as though God were making his appeal through us God using us making his appeal through us You've heard, it say, you've heard Brian say sometimes, maybe God needs better advertising. If we're his advertising, maybe he needs to get a new marketing campaign. But God doesn't do it that way. He does it through you and me. Imperfect vessels makes us ambassadors. That means that we don't belong to this world. We belong to his world. Our passport has heaven stamped on it. We're going to go there one day, and we have to represent that world here in this one. We have to represent heaven here on this world. Something struck me. Um, I read Greg Laurie's little morning uh, devotional, and I'll, you know, sometimes I'll uh, I'll read it and I'll be in such a hurry it'll just go. Whew, thanks, I'm on my way. But I, something struck me several weeks ago that Greg Laurie said, and it wasn't actually it wasn't actually quoting Christ or, or Paul or anybody in the Bible. It's something that he was proclaiming about, basically about himself. It's a pretty interesting comment. Greg Laurie said, and he's a pastor in Har at Harvest Crusade down south. Greg Laurie said, I am just an ordinary person who took God for his word. Just an ordinary guy who took God for his word. If you don't know about Greg Laurie's life, it's, you know, he didn't have a father. As a matter of fact, he had seven of them. And, uh, you know, it just, just wasn't a great childhood. And, and yet, You'd think this guy, if anybody would be cold and callous to God's word, this, it would be this teenager when he, was, when he came to know Christ. But somehow, God's word got to him, and he took him at his word. He just believed it. He wasn't like, oh, God, I'm going to hold all this other stuff against you. If you're really God, this wouldn't have happened. It, you know, it's like, oh, I'll, I'll try it. I'll look at this word, and I'll take it for his word. And he believed it. Changed his life changed millions of other people's lives. God used him as an ambassador. He now holds an evangelical a ministry called Harvest Crusade around the world. I mean, he's just a great speaker for God. And the thing I love about Greg Laurie is he's just so real. He's so real if you ever hear him. He's, he's just so down to earth. Um, uh, it's really hard when you get to be, you know, little old me, it's easy to be real, right? It's easy to be real in a room of 30 people. But when you're in a room of 3,000 people every Sunday, and you, got, you're, you basically have to have security wherever you go, it's hard. It's hard. And yet he still is. He was an ordinary guy. Took, took God at his word. Listen to some other ordinary guys. Just a little church history here. D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody sold shoes. Sold shoes for a living. Sold shoes for a living. Took God at his word. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a prominent doctor. All walks of life. Took God at his word. Alan Redpath. He was an accountant. He's a bean counter. Took God at his word. Peter. John. James. All fishermen. Probably not very good ones. They were fishing in, with nets in, in, in the Sea of Galilee. Probably not great fishermen there. They just took God at his word. Uh, I'll, I'll use some, pardon, pardon this, guys. I'll use some uh, examples from our audience here. Will, Will over there, he works at Google. Ordinary job, writes code, deals with vendors. Took God at his word. I, I sell. I'm a sales guy. I'm a salesman. Not a very good one. You know? But I took God at his word. Andrew climbs poles for a living. I don't know what he does when he's up there. He charges himself with electricity. <clears throat> Took God at his word. 
Brian, not here this week, but you know what Brian does on his off time? He cuts hair. He's a barber. He would tell you he's a stylist, but he's a barber. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, he took God at his word. He took God at his word. My question for you is, whatever you do with your life, it's your job to take God at his word. And then he takes care of the rest. Because when you take God at his word, when you make the Lord Jesus Christ your savior, you take God at his word, God intercedes. God takes action on you personally. And you know what he does? God, through his divine and superior power, gives you everything you need for a godly life, for a life that serves him, for a life that honors him, for a life that prospers both him and you. How does he do it? He does it through the knowledge. Whose knowledge? Your knowledge. Your knowledge of him. That's Jesus Christ, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Furthermore, through those things, through everything he's given you, he's going to give you his very great and prized promises. They're so prized that Peter tells us that even the angels look into these things. Why? Why does he give you these promises? Why does he give you everything he needs? You need, excuse me? Why does he do that? So that you, the mystery of it all is, so that you may partake, you may partake, you may participate in the divine nature. That's his master plan. That's not my plan. His master plan in salvation in the salvation of others because you are no longer held captive meaning you have escaped the corruption of this world.